Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. So <clears throat> to say that while I will be presenting some of the kind of the climate science, uh, I'm not a scientist myself. Uh, I'm a psychotherapist is my background. Um, I did my master's in mindfulness studies and I teach martial arts here in Kwak Jordan. Um, but also I suppose I'm a father of kids and I live in this community and just trying to protect this living, uh, this living planet going forward is really, really important to me uh, because there's serious risks which I think some of us are aware of. So something to keep in mind through this talk is this idea of the precautionary principle which is saying that <clears throat> even if we don't fully understand something, as long as there is enough evidence that there, uh, something bad could happen and the consequences would be terrible, then we should avoid it at all costs. So it's kind of obvious, but in, one, in another way, this precautionary principle, it's in all areas of life. Uh, we see regulations for them in public, uh, in health and safety, and yeah, these regulations are everywhere. Uh, and the first part of the talk is just showing how we completely um, neglect the precautionary principle when it comes to climate change. So yeah, there's going to be two parts to this talk. We're going to look at the climate science in the first part. Um, and the second part we'll look at some of the, what we can do about it or some of the ways Extinction Rebellion is trying to mobilise people. Traditionally when we give a talk on climate change we try to be a bit hopeful and we try to say that there's light at the end of the tunnel, we put a bit of greenwash on it and say everything's alright if we just do uh, a few things and uh, things are going to be fine. This is a different type of talk because um, basically we're going to be telling the truth, we're going to be saying that this is uh, the data, this is things as they stand, and then when we extrapolate from that, we can see that we're in a state of serious threat. Um, and <clears throat> I can say that when we actually look at that, we can have all sorts of different reactions to that. Uh, traditionally, what we've used is denial and ways to just not connect with this. But I like the way Extinction Rebellion sign off a lot of their emails, the sense of with love and rage. I think they're really appropriate uh, responses to this really connecting with love to, to actually how important the natural world is to us and then rage at its destruction. Grief as well is, this is another thing Sing Shun Bayan often say in their meetings, is this sense that grief is welcome, it is that grief is how we actually take information, we take it from the head and we bring it into the heart and we actually connect with what this means and then from this we're then in a position to integrate this and bring it into our lives. So. Uh, I think that's really important is that there is an emotional journey here as well to, that this isn't just information this this is real you know and um, acting as if this truth mattered to us yeah just beginning this introduction I wanted to mention this paper by Jen Bendel it's brilliant it's freely available online I really recommend I recommend reading it um, he explores a bit what will happen if we continue along this trajectory that we're on, which, as you can see from the title, it doesn't look great. Um, <clears throat> it's worth noting he wasn't able to get this paper published um, at the, sorry, for the journal which he was working for, so he decided to self-publish it, but since then it's, it's been downloaded so often that they're even struggling with their servers. Um, <clears throat> but the reviewers didn't question the science behind the paper, they questioned the emotional impact it would have on its readers. So I mean, from that we can see the information even from academia that's coming to us is being managed. Um, yeah, I think it's also, uh, is it, oh, who was it I was listening to the other day, he was saying that fear of us being emotion paralyzed by overwhelming, by information we don't know how to cope with. He, he was saying, I think it was David Wallace Wells, he was saying actually if you look around there's far more danger of complacency than people being overwhelmed. Uh, and paralysed. And yet, very often we'll find when we contend with this information, a lot of us are really impelled into action because this is the only rational response we can come up with. Um, Jem also in this paper says that sense that people have this fear of despair and eliciting despair in people, as if despair is a fixed state. And he says actually despair and grief, these are states along a journey and how we actually you know, it's a bit like with grief, if we've lost someone, we move through despair, but then we move to a broader understanding that, <clears throat> uh, yeah, allows us to be more in touch with reality and to then come up with more wise action from that position. 
Yeah, I would also say a, 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 a significant part of this paper explores uh, ideas about denial and how de humans use denial when we encounter information that we don't know how to deal with. Uh, in particular, how we've, as a species, have used this in relation to climate change, why we're not really contending with this. Um, I think that's worth noting, both in terms of recognising that this is how we as a, popular, as a people have been responding to some of these threats which we've known about, but also in terms of, in our own process, if we notice ourselves encountering any form of denial, like, oh, this can't be true, or it's true, but I'm sure it'll be fine, or even just distancing ourselves, just to notice this is actually really natural. So this is that human experience of denial as a coping mechanism, or if we're talking about with other people and they are used forms of denial. And at the same time, while we can recognise this, I'd say if we can't find any evidence or something to contradict, or to show a different way uh, in terms of this, then, we, then I would suggest we take this information as being real, as being true, and that we again, with this sense that we act as if the truth matters. Uh, I would say as well, it does take courage to keep our minds open to this, in particular to keep our hearts uh, open to this too. Okay, just ending this introduction uh, with a quote from David Attenborough. It's always good to see a familiar face. So he's not a politician, or a, uh, he, but he's, <coughs> yeah, he's a, most people will agree he's an expert on the natural world and he knows his stuff. So he's been speaking lately. So this quote saying, right now we're facing a man-made disaster of global scale, our greatest threat in thousands of years, climate change. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilization and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. It's really important to have known faces and people that people recognize bring this message forward. There is a new BBC documentary, as far as I know, coming out, which you'll be speaking about climate change. And again, this is important in bringing this to the people at large. And yet, it'll be interesting to see if they dare name the fossil fuel uh, companies and the industries that are promoting this and or that, that are driving climate change. So this is World Scientists Warning to Humanity, 1992. Over 1,700 scientists from around the world, including uh, then the, no, uh, the majority of then living Nobel laureates and scientists drafted this to humanity about the dangers we were facing through climate change. 25 years later, uh, <clears throat> so just two years ago, over 20,000 scientists uh, signed a second warning about the severe and existential threats posed, to negative, uh, posed by negative social and environmental trends. The authors of this concluded that action must be taken to, and I quote, to avoid widespread, mis widespread misery and catastrophic biodiversity loss. Soon it will be too late to shift our course from the failing trajectory and time is running out. We must recognise in our day-to-day -day lives and in our governing institutions that Earth with all its life is our only home. So this is a second warning to humanity by over 20,000 scientists. Yet, I, I, I know I can say I wasn't aware of this until recently enough, so something as noteworthy as this is not being conveyed to us. Uh, <clears throat> could also say in that time frame, in those 25 years, as far as I know, we've increased carbon, uh, the carbon, <coughs> the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but <coughs> it's, I've heard different figures from 40% to 60%. I don't know the percentage, but yeah. we've been plateauing been over recent years, but the last two mm. years have gone up again. Yeah. So if we take this, so it means that this means that most, or at least half of this damage has been done in our lifetimes, like even in my adult life. You know, so we as a generation are responsible. You know, this has happened on our watch and therefore the responsibility falls to us. We could also compare this to if we got a diagnosis of diabetes 25 years ago, we've been on a binge since then and we haven't taken this information as serious. So, um, yeah. Just a couple of definitions, just to say for the science, it's not important to grasp, but to remember all the definitions and understand all the science as long as we get the gist of it. Just going briefly <coughs> through these definitions, so the IPCC, the International Governmental Panel on Climate Change, so this was set up uh, in 1988 
uh, when all the governments of the world first agreed that there was a problem with climate change and that we needed to do something about it. They do great work, uh, but an issue with it is <coughs> they tend to, they, scientists by nature tend to be quite conservative um, and they tend to underestimate how bad uh, things actually are. It takes a long time to get consensus of, body, of a body that size um, and a long time to document extinction rates and so on. So, um, and it also, the IPCC contains uh, policy makers and economists, so it's not strictly just pure science, but they do a lot of good work too. The Paris Agreement uh, in 2015, uh, governments of the world met in Paris, tried to find an international agreement how we tackle climate change. Uh, they said we should, agreed all countries of the world should reduce our emissions to ideally 1.5, but 2 degrees at the top is where we above pre-industrial standards, although uh, the target wasn't legally binding. So, yeah, the scientific consensus is if we can cap it at 1.5, then the worst effects of climate change could be avoided. They would say at 2 degrees, then it may still not pose an existential threat, a threat to our existence, um, but the effects would still be catastrophic. This is a graph, this just shows some of the conservative tendencies of the IPC. So this uh, graph is showing their forecasts, this is an old graph as it happens, but the red line is just showing, this is the readings from the instruments on the ground, so you can see a huge difference between where that's at and where the IPCC are reporting. So <clears throat> again, this just shows, it's just one way of showing the sense that academia can be quite conservative, but in recent times we do see some, uh, scientists breaking rank with this trend. This is Professor Hans-Joachim Schellenhuber, senior advisor to Angela Merkel and to Pope Francis. So he's a mainstream scientist, but clearly a credible voice, a voice with some authority. He says that climate change is now reaching the end game. And the, uh, the issue is the very survival of our civilization. Looking a little more closely at the data from the Arctic, Okay, so this is just trend lines um, showing the history of the Arctic sea ice in September minimum. And from this, we can kind of make predictions as to uh, <coughs> how this is going. So, and from this, we can see uh, if things follow these particular trends that there will be, the Arctic will be free of sea ice in the summer in probably 2023, the next four or five years. It's not ring of the stone, we won't, I mean, things are always more complex. You can't make solid predictions and scientists rarely make predictions. They talk about likelihoods and because of that it doesn't really stay in our minds as strongly. But nonetheless, this is the trend of what we're following. So this particular, the melting of the Arctic sea ice is one example of a worrying feedback loop called the albedo effect. So if we think about it, uh, Arctic sea ice, it's white, it reflects the sun uh, back um, but when that melts, the dark sea absorbs the, sun, uh, the temperature and the sunlight a lot more. So the more the, sea, the ice melts, the more dark sea there is to absorb that uh, sunlight uh, and therefore the less ice and also the cooling effect of the ice as well also uses a lot of the, the heat that's come into Earth. So, um, yeah, so this is one very serious problem, but which gets worse and worse t as time goes on. But what we're realizing lately as well is these feedback loops don't operate in isolation. There's a number of different feedback loops. They call them more feedback, cas feedback cascades. So like dominoes, one thing tips into another. Because when we think about it, very few things can be said to operate in isolation. So this was a paper released last year. Um, the National Academy of Sciences um, <coughs> called the Hothouse Earth Effect. And it looked at 10 different feedback loops and how they can tip into each other, like the El Nino, um, the, the jet stream. Uh, it looked at the permafrost and the tundra, and when that melts, the massive levels of uh, methane that, are <coughs> that could be released underneath this. So, and it says that looking at all these, it suggests that the Earth can flip from just two degrees, which is what the Paris Agreement is aiming at, and it, can <coughs> it could tip into this hothouse Earth effect and stay there. So it's saying that it, it needs to be 1.5. We need to cap the temperatures at 1.52 is just, in terms of that precautionary principle, is just far too risky. 
So this has led Johan Rockenström from the Stockholm Resilience Centre to say 50 years ago, even five years ago, this type of stuff would have been seen as alarmist. But now scientists have started to become really worried. And there is a notable change in the language being used by scientists these days. So when temperature rises, so this is looking at some of the temperature rises shown that were one, said to be 1.1 above pre-industrial standards. A paper released by the University of Washington last year said, uh, I think it was last year, said that we, uh, estimating how likely we are to get to these thresholds, said we have a 1% chance of hitting that 1.5 degree target. So 1%. Is we have a 5% chance of hitting 2 degrees, the likely range being between 2 and 5 degrees. So if we take a median of being, for instance, 3.2, you've horrendous consequences at that type of temperature. And this looks like it's happening in the lifetime of kids today or in our own lifetimes. So the type of things that happen at 3 degrees are like the Amazon starts to burn down and it <coughs> It stops, becoming, it stops sequestering carbon in the way it's currently doing and starts becoming a producer of carbon. We look at massive crop failures. We look at massive levels of flooding, major droughts, <coughs> rapid desertification and heat waves, the type of stuff that we're seeing on the news all the time these days. And also if we look at what happens in history when, when food fails, we get food price spikes. So these are just some images from the last few days. This is Cyclone Idi in Mozambique. So there's, there's really horrendous footage at the moment of like people trying to escape the flood waters. This is Nebraska as well, so it's hitting into the Western world if we choose to make a difference. Huge flooding there. Wildfires in, Ca in California from last year. This is Ireland. This is worth noting. This is the Vartry. Uh, uh, reservoir, if I'm saying that right, in Wicklow. So just last year in that heat wave, so between September and uh, well, July below, and then September above. So we can see there's massive, massive threats to our own security here, to our food security and to, to our survival. Uh, this was also, <coughs> just put this slide in today, this is looking at, these were the shelves last year the beast from the east, the bit of snow which we had, this is before the snow proper landed, the, the shelves were empty of bread, milk, uh, and all of the things that we consider essential. So with a few days of snow, so we can see how underprepared we are if there was a serious threat. Okay, so this is some other, uh, another theory. This is saying that there's a lot of temperature rises locked in, but yet that haven't landed yet, but that are essentially unavoidable. I won't go through each one of them, but it's made like, so for instance, the albedo effect we talked about, the cooling effect of air pollution or global dimming, as they're saying. So this is, if we tackle air pollution or if we have societal collapse and are no longer able to pollute the air, then <clears throat> without these aerosol particles in the air, essentially this has a knock-on effect and the temperatures rise because these are acting a bit like a shield from the sun's rays. So when we don't have that air pollution, we then actually get to feel the full force of the temperature rise that we have. So this is even, I think this is before we really take into account things like methane from the tundra and so on. So we're looking at locked in temperatures that could say that this is either already potentially too late or at least um, calls for serious concern and calls for taking this as urgently as we can. Looking rising temperatures cause uh, sea level rise. So this map doesn't show very well, but shows uh, areas <coughs> that will be most affected. So London, New York, Kolkata, um, places essentially uninhabitable and wiped out. <coughs> Leads to migration on a scale that the world has never seen before. The World Bank themselves estimate that 140 million people on the move by 2050. Other studies say it could be up to 1 billion. So we could, <coughs> we could estimate this as being between two or 300 million people on the move. And this is in the next 20, this is just tw over 20 years. So my kids will be in their early 30s at this point. Society can't cope with that level of people on the move. They're barely coping with the Syrian refugee crisis at the moment, and that's like one to two million people. So if we imagine how we're gonna respond with at least two to 300 times that, and 
even aside from global migration in Ireland, there are two million people living within 5k of the coast and we're expecting one meter of sea level rise by the end of the century if temperatures are kept within two degrees. So there's going to be significant uh, population movements in Ireland too that we have to contend with. Other ecological pressures as well as climate change, although most, they're very related, so just sheer ecological destruction and change of the natural world. So ocean acidification set to double by the end of the century. The oceans are actually the lungs of the earth, even more so than the forests, and <clears throat> but it's reliant on a thriving ecosystem which is breaking down. Um, major problems on the land too, soil fertility being one. David Wall from Chagas says that in the last 13 years, we've lost 40% of uh, soil fertility. That's massive. That's almost half soil fertility in the last 13 years. In the UK, Michael Grove says that they're 30 to 40 years away from uh, a loss of a fundamental loss of soil fertility. There's other problems with habitat loss, intensive farming, deforestation areas of the rainforest being cleared for palm oil and beef production. So leading Maria McNutt, uh, president of the National Academy of Sciences, to say that even the most optimistic predictions are dire. We could say this is all terrible, but why <coughs> are we talk, why is this talk headed for extinction? So we think of uh, the last uh, extinction there with the dinosaurs being caused by an asteroid strike. But it's worth noting four of the last five major extinctions um, have been caused by sudden increases in atmospheric greenhouse gases. Uh, the last one, the Permian, where they say 97% of life on this planet died off, was caused by a, a runaway cascade of feedback loops, which results in the gassing of the planet by hydrogen sulfide. And it's worth noting that we're actually pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at, a moment that, at the moment at a rate that mirrors the Permian extinction. And we understand some of the mechanisms by how this happens. You know, even just one of these being that, you know, with no ice at the poles, then there's no, the winds and the currents shut off and the oceans stagnate, which then produces hydrogen sulfide, which basically makes it impossible for mammals to breathe. And aside from looking forward, we can say at the very moment we're in the midst, midst of what's been called the sixth mass extinction event. And one of these reports that's uh, in a lot of people's minds these days is relating to uh, the loss of or insect mageddon, as they're saying, the loss of uh, insects. So the, in a, a report that was done in Germany that said in the last 25 years, three quarters of the insects are just gone. So it's sometimes thought of like the bug splat effect. So we know that when we were younger, when we were driving, people needed to use the windscreen wipers a lot. We don't need to do that as much now. Sorry, they needed to do that to clear the bugs off the windshield. That's not happening now because we don't have that much um, insects left, which is obviously a huge problem in terms of pollinators and so on. So one way to get a feel for this, can, uh, <coughs> for what this effect is, can I ask everybody in the room just to stand up, please? Stand too. So, if we take that this is a representation of the insects that were there 25 years ago. Oh, I can see. Yeah. So when I was 17, if this was uh, a representation of the insects, could I ask this level of the room to sit down, please? And so if we actually just take a look and see, this is what's left 25 years later. And where is this going? So thank you. You can sit down too now. It's catastrophic the changes that have happened in our own lifetimes. Well, so if you actually look at the change we made on the fabric of life, if, uh, in terms of lifestyle, in terms of everything, nine of all mammals on Earth now, we teach kids about a world with, you know, rhinos and giraffes and tigers and lions. The reality is 96% of mammals on Earth are livestock and humans only. So if you were to have a real thing, it'd be cow, 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 cow. The hens stretch to a multitude. I read a thing saying 70% of the birds on this planet, I, I can't, 70% of the birds on this planet are hens. You know, we've so radically changed the landscape uh, and living fabric of this planet. So, uh, Tanya Steele, chief executive of WWF, says we're the first generation to know we're destroying the planet and the last that can actually do anything about it. 
looking at this theme of human extinction. This is a paper, he's saying that at the moment there's a 1 in 20 percent chance that the carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere can pose an existential threat. If you remember that we're heading towards 3 degrees of warming, maybe 3.2 uh, or possibly 5, this says there's a 1 in 20 chance that the carbon dioxide that's already in the atmosphere could cause an existential threat. When we go over 5 degrees, we just don't know. Okay. So 3 degrees is catastrophic, uh, and this could be by 2050, so within our own lifetime, let alone our children's lifetime. He says that 4 degrees would result in hundreds of millions of people dying of hunger, and even just the heat itself is deadly at that point. So the author says, putting it into perspective, how many of us would choose to buckle our children to an aeroplane seat if we knew there was as much a ch of a chance as 1 in 20 of that plane crashing? And with climate change that poses this existential risk, we've already put them in that plane. So things are speeding up so rapidly, you know, when we say <coughs> so insects, animals, uh, plant life disappearing, planetary resources being consumed at an exponential rate. You know, when we see these graphs and we see like, for instance, our carbon emissions or we see the loss of life and we see that the spike just goes up like this. This is, I uh, felt this was a very good video, David Suzuki looking, explaining in plain English uh, the nature of exponential growth. So this is Our home, the biosphere, is finite and fixed. It can't grow. And if the economy is a part of and utterly dependent on the biosphere, the attempt to maintain endless growth is an impossibility. Let me show you why. Steady growth over time, whether it's the, the amount of garbage you make, the size of your city, the population of the world, anything growing steadily is called exponential growth. And anything growing exponentially has a predictable doubling time. I am going to give you a system analogous to the planet. It's a test tube full of food for bacteria. So the test tube and food is the planet and the bacteria are us. I'm going to add one bacterial cell to the test tube and it's going to begin to divide every minute. That's exponential growth. So at the beginning there's one cell. One minute there are two. Two minutes there are four. Three minutes there are eight. That's exponential growth. And at 60 minutes, the test tube is completely packed with bacteria and there's no food left. So we have a 60 minute growth cycle. When is the test tube half full? And of course the answer is at 59 minutes. 59 minutes it's only half full, but one minute later it's completely full. So at 58 minutes it's 25% full. 57 minutes it's 12.5% full. At 55 minutes of a 60 minute cycle it's 3% full. So let's suppose that 55 minutes, one of the bacteria says, hey guys, I've been thinking, we got a population problem. The other bacteria would say, Jack, what the hell have you been smoking? 97% of the test tube's empty and we've been around for 55 minutes. <laughs> They'd be five minutes away from filling it. So bacteria are no smarter than people. At 59 minutes they go, oh my God, Jack is right, we got one minute left. What are we going to do now? Well, we better give that money to those scientists, maybe they can pull us out of this. But the world for the bacteria is a test tube and food. How can they possibly add any more food or space to that world? They can't. They can no more add food or space than we can add air, water, soil, or biodiversity to the biosphere. This is not speculation or hypothesis. It is straight mathematical certainty. And every scientist I have talked to agrees with me. We're already past the 59th minute. So all the demand for relentless growth is a call to accelerate down what is a suicidal path. And by focusing on growth, growth, we fail to ask the important questions, like how much is enough? Are there no limits? Are we happier with all this stuff? What is an economy for? We never ask those questions. Great. So we could look at this and say, uh, <clears throat> like this is dire, we could wonder why we're not getting told, that if we were less cynical, we could wonder why we're not getting told this in the media, given uh, how, how serious this situation is. 
Uh, a couple of two things to consider are both denial, which we spoke of earlier, and also <coughs> a mass, a, a very well-funded campaign of disinformation by uh, companies who are making a lot of money by us continuing in the direction we are going. Um, but it's also worth knowing people do know about this. So this is a quote from Douglas Rushkoff, an American professor. He says he was invited to speak to a group of billionaires, uh, the 1%, um, or 0.1%. He says, last year I got invited to a super private uh, deluxe resort to deliver a keynote speech to what I assumed would be 100 or so investment bankers. By far the largest fee he'd ever received, uh, half of his yearly salary to de uh, deliver insight on the subject of the future of technology. Says his audience was brought in five super wealthy uh, guys from the upper echelon of the hedge fund world. Says after a bit of small talk, he realized they had no interest in what he had come to speak <coughs> about the future of technology. They'd come with their questions of their own. Which region will be less impacted by the coming climate crisis, New Zealand or Alaska? Says finally, the CEO of a, a brokerage house explained he nearly completed building his own underground bunker uh, and says, how does he maintain authority over his security force after the event? Says this single question occupied them for the rest of the hour. They knew guards would be required to protect the food sources, but how would they pay them when money, money was worthless? So they considered um, you know, what would stop them choosing their own leader. They consider different kind of combination locks or making the guards wear disciplinary collars uh, <clears throat> or maybe building robots if that could be, if that technology could be built in time. Uh, so this phrase, the event, is the term that elite are giving to the breakdown of society they're anticipating. Apparently it's talked about a lot in elite circles. We could also speculate about Trump's wall. Why would someone need a wall? Touch on one more theme, almost before the break, uh, before we take a moment. So this is population. So population expected to grow to almost 10 billion in just over 20 years. So with 2.4 uh, billion more mouths to feed, we can wonder how can these people be fed, especially when poor countries get richer, they naturally want to live a more Western lifestyle, consuming more meat, more dairy. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, how are people going to get fed when things get bad? Which brings us to the theme of famine. And in Ireland, we have uh, obviously this is, is in our history, but I don't think it's really in our mind or in our psyche. I at least can't claim to really know much of what that was like. But there have been other famines, so um, <clears throat> I want to read a, a quote just to give a flavour of what life can be like in these times. I want to say as well, this can be quite grim, even kind of connecting with some of this stuff, but it's worth getting a picture so we can kind of, to help us not connect to this. So, so this is an extract from Timothy Snyder's book uh, of a famine that was in the Ukraine in the 30s and 40s, before and during World War II. So he says, in Ukraine cities, hundreds of, or, Hundreds of thousands of people waited each day for a simple loaf of bread. People appeared at two in the morning to queue in front of shops that didn't open until seven. On an average day, 40,000 people would wait for bread. Those in line were so desperate to keep their places that they'd cling to the belts of those immediately in front of them. Some were so weak from hunger they couldn't stand without the ballast of strangers. The waiting lasted all day and sometimes two. Pregnant women, maimed war veterans, lost their right to buy out a turn and had to wait in line with the rest if they wanted to eat. Continues. Going on, I'll say, he says, survival was a moral as well as a physical struggle. A woman doctor wrote to a friend and, and said that she hadn't yet become a cannibal, but she wasn't sure that she wouldn't be one by the time the letter reaches her friend. The good people died first. Those who refused to steal or prostitute themselves died. Those who gave food to others died. Those who refused to eat corpses died. Those who refused to kill their fellow man died. Could also look at, I won't say much on this, but <clears throat> all these conditions, crop failures, mass migration, ongoing disasters, they're the perfect breeding ground for fascism. So 
Uh, and if we actually look at these warning signs of fascism, we can see that these are already in place. Um, and we know that the reality is fascism hijacks democracy again and again, um, particularly under extreme circumstances and this ecological crisis that we're facing goes off the scale of extreme circumstances. This is Kate Marvel researching humanity's effect on climate and what we can expect in the future. She says we need courage, not hope. She says to be a climate scientist is to be an active participant in a slow motion horror film. We're inevitably sending our children to live on an unfamiliar planet. As a climate scientist, I'm often asked to speak about hope. Climate si uh, change is bleak, the organizers say. Give a <coughs> Tell us a happy story, give us hope. She says, the problem is I haven't got any. But she goes on to say, she says, the opposite of hope is not despair, it's grief. So even while we resolve to limit the damage, we can mourn. And here the scale of the provo problem provides a perverse comfort that we're actually all in this together. Swiftness of change, its scale and inevitability binds us into one, broken hearts trapped under a warm atmosphere. So we need courage, not hope. Grief is the cost of being alive. We're all fated to live, we are all fated to live, live lives shot through with sadness and our lives aren't worth any less for it. So courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. This is the end of the first part of this talk, the end of the part on natural science. So I'm going to take a minute to allow these facts to sink in and for us to connect with where we might be at. at. The biggest challenge isn't to try to understand all of this or try to remember the facts that go with it, it's to come up with an appropriate emotional response. Very often we listen to these talks and we kind of move on the next day or don't think much about it. It's not appropriate anymore. So I would say there is a process, it takes time to allow this information, it takes courage to keep our minds open to receive some of this information, to keep our hearts open to actually connect and realize what this means to us in our lives, of the lives of, the, of those we love, and then allowing this to inform our lives. So I'm gonna pause for a moment just to allow people to connect with where they're at. And grief is very welcome. We'll take a minute or so of silence. So we're going to shift in tone, we're going to look at some of what we can do to try to, <clears throat> and what is a wise way to respond given what we've just heard. Just hope by itself isn't likely to do much. Considering where we're actually at with maturity and openness though, and then we can consider how do we want to act. But the talk isn't about hope because if we look at it, things are pretty bleak. Um, I would say it's important to feel this grief and to not turn away. This is something we can do. I'd say this is a duty we have to the next generation, is to actually feel what this is really like. This, <clears throat> if we can really feel the grief and move through it, we can experience a shift in our consciousness from powerlessness into service. It's a courageous thing to really face this with eyes open. Some of this guy's writings are lovely. Stephen Jenkins. He writes about our death phobic culture. He says our dying times are an opportunity to really live well if we pay attention to how precious life really is. He says we come to peace when we realize that life is far bigger than any of us as individuals and we understand our role in the service of life as we join in a line of worthy ancestors. Those who went before us and those who come after us. 
and we make our lives about honoring and protecting those who come after us. Indigenous cultures, they speak about protecting the, set, the next seven generations. And in this age of ecological meltdown, when our children's future is currently set to an unimaginable catastrophe, it's our job to allow ourselves to feel this grief and then figure out how do we intend to act. It is a big shift in our consciousness away from a deeply embedded uh, culture of narcissistic consumerism where we ask what do I need for myself uh, to feel better? Uh, how do I hang on to privilege for myself, for my family? And it moves towards accepting that this is a time of grief, but we can still appreciate beauty and we can keep ourselves in shape for the task that's required of us. It asks us to step into service and to be willing to do the things that might make a difference. So this is quite a mental shift and an emotional shift and one that can be quite liberating. This is another perspective, looking back at David Suzuki, uh, he'd say it's not helpful to say it's too late because realistically we can never know. But he says it is helpful to say it's very late and it is very urgent. We never know, we might just pull it out of the fire. He has a very good talk called uh, why, we need to, uh, why We Need to Think About Human Extinction. A number of us got together to watch and it's always good to, um, to digest some of this stuff with others rather than trying to do this all by ourselves. And it is possible that we can make changes. This is a t looking uh, when we have as a society made huge changes. So this is looking back, the Second World War. Um, so huge changes were made very, very quickly. And the threat was also existential. So much of our lives are <clears throat> on a, uh, the world is shaped by economy and by, mo uh, by money. So this was really, the threat was existential. So the whole of the American economy was trans transformed to serve the purpose of winning the war. At the peak of the war, just over half of the expenditure was devoted to the war. Um, factories that used to produce cars converted almost overnight to making tanks. Consumer industries like cotton um, really went down. Um, everything became just about survival and about winning the war. So it is possible that civilizations can change when they really, really focus. And again, in this case as well, the threat was existential. It was, the motivation was just survival. Given what we've been looking at, looking at how Ireland has up to now been responding, um, Ireland, we're currently the second worst performer in terms of actually meeting uh, <coughs> our, carb, uh, our climate change uh, commitments. So, and we will be facing fines from next year of 450 million per, uh, per year until we're compliant. And then there will be other um, targets that we actually uh, need to meet as well. This is money which if we were actually able to wake up, this could be invested in trying to prepare ourselves, deep adaptation and investment in renewables, investments in something going forward. So looking at uh, Ireland, how other responses <coughs> going down through these. So plans for a new runway in Dublin airport, despite the huge damage that air travel is actually doing. Increasing the herd by 400,000. Almost no uh, solar energy development so far. Still subsidizing peak production. Okay, this is looking at the, uh, <coughs> the Waza case, just things to be aware of. The Waza case brought friends of the Irish environment brought uh, the Irish government to, co uh, to court in January over our in unknowingly contributing to dangerous levels of climate change. So, actually, I haven't heard a result, uh, if, if a result has emerged from this yet. So, this is, it hasn't, uh, but it's one to be aware of and one to watch. And I know that the judge did comment on the notable level of public interest in this, in that, like, there was people were sitting on the floor as the courtroom was packed. That doesn't normally happen in court cases. They're pretty boring, you know, having sat in on some before. Looking at social responses to these threats. So what do we do when your government is actively promoting uh, the gassing of the world and driving extinction events? So if you do it generally in society, if you do a bad thing, you get punished. And there's a progression to this. If you hit somebody in the face, um, you could face a fine or be brought to court. Uh, if the, if you, there's a progression, the worse the offence, the worse the punishment. Looking in Nazi Germany, those who could be prosecuted were brought to the Nuremberg trials. 
Um, but as an analogy, what if the gas that was being used was actually carbon dioxide and the killing that was happening if it was the extermination of life on this planet? And that's what's happening essentially through climate change and this is being enabled by the governments in the world and by corporations. So I would say it's the duty of, if the governments and the corporations aren't stopping this, then it is the duty of people to stop this. There comes a time where rebellion is necessary. And if we look across at social perspectives, um, political theorists across the spectrum from left to right are united when they say there is a time where rebellion is justified. And just to say extinction rebellion ourselves would not uh, have no pit political allegiance anywhere. You know, where this is issue led. Looking at different theorists, um, political theorists, so Karl Marx, the father of socialism, widely known, he was very supportive and encouraged rebellion at times. John Locke, a liberal theorist, uh, coined what uh, philosophers call the right of revolution. Uh, it says when governments fail to protect the life the lives and livelihoods of their citizens, people have a right to rebel. For conservative types, which could be considered like Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael, Thomas Hobbes, a conservative, coined what he called the social contract and said that the state derives its authority from its willingness and ability to maintain order for its, the security of its people. The obligation of, su of subjects to the sovereign is understood to last as long and no longer and the power by which he's able, they're able to protect them. So there is clearly a case that there is a time where rebellion is justified and necessary. And this is where we are at. So we're asking people to act, uh, to, to act as if the information presented here is, is real and to look at what is an appropriate response. Conventional approach to trying to generate change is like petitions, leaflets, trying to raise awareness, all very good things but not appropriate for threats which are existential and as urgent as this are at. I'm not saying they shouldn't be done, but if that's the only uh, means of mobilization, it's not going to work for where we're at. Yeah, there's too many powerful economic interests that uh, keep the status quo where it is. So in these cases, what we're looking at or what we're advocating is <coughs> an appropriate response being high stake, disruptive civil disobedience non-violent civil disobedience. So looking through history, this is, we're not reinventing the wheel, this is how change has often come about in society. So you have Mandela, you have Gandhi, you have James Hansen, uh, father of climate uh, justice. All these people have been arrested many times. This is one of, uh, <coughs> yeah, one of the ways of really getting attention, both of, policy, of uh, lawmakers and of the public. When we do this, when people really are civilly, like, cause disruptive, disruption, people often kind of say some version of, I like what you're saying, yeah, I agree with what you're saying, but I don't like the way you're saying it. We would say that the important point is they're actually talking about it. This is one way to get the message across when the media, by their own, by their own accord, clearly is not conveying the message in the way that it needs to be conveyed. So... Um, also, when people see how serious you are about a cause, it tends to wake people up a little bit. And so much of our lives are dominated by emotion. So when they see that we're prepared to take sacrifices, even to, to sacrifice our own liberty, so some people who, will, uh, who may be arrested, like that, that there is this level of commitment. This is one way that people go, wow, there's a large number of people taking this seriously. Um, one of the things to say, this is non-violent, uh, civil disobedience. So this non-violent aspect is key to this movement. So part on a, for a number of reasons. One of being actually non-violent. This is the world we want to create. You know, is a world with respect. So you know, even respecting if the authorities or the police are arresting someone or doing something like that, they're treated with respect. But also, um, so it's morally worthwhile, but it's also materially worthwhile. If you're vi the, the data says, if you're violent, it's ju you just tend not to be as successful. You alienate people. And there's a good, it's very strong grounding in history, looking at Gandhi and Martin Luther King and so on. So at some level, when we're standing up to the state, it, there's a bit in which it's a numbers game. The more people you have, the more effective this is going to be. 
And yet, uh, we know from research by Erika Chenoweth, she analyzed, I think it was 323 uprisings and said that in reality, uh, like the idea of the people rising up, she would say in reality, the people are like about 3.5% is what she's come up with. So it's not everyone, we won't get everybody to respond. But if we get enough people, and also depending on the actions you're taking, you, can need, you need less people. Like a huge number of people on a march is a fantastic thing to do. And yet a small number of people who are really being uh, disruptive and making, <clears throat> you know, really drawing attention to something like that can uh, generate more media and put more pressure on politicians for change at times. So these are just some recent examples of non-violent civil disobedience. So even just choosing one, if we looked at, for instance, the water charge, so like whatever we think about any of these, there'd be people on one side or another of any of these different protests um, that people have engaged in. But the important point on this is people essentially rebelled. There was you know, a huge pressure from the government, a huge funding and directive from the EU to implement these water charges. And essentially, I mean, and people said no. People, uh, there was massive levels of just protest, marches, but people were, uh, were willing to just not pay. People were willing to be arrested. I think people even took the meters out of the ground. So people really just said no. Uh, and as a result, the water scra uh, charges were scrapped. It wouldn't have happened if, the, or it's unlikely to have happened, if it was, if it was petitions and more um, civilly, or what you call it, acceptable methods of protest. School strikes movement. The image is great, isn't it? This was only a couple of weeks ago. 15,000 people in Ireland, uh, 140,000 people in Australia, uh, students and adults on protest. Uh, it's the largest climate uh, march there's ever been in Ireland. So I'd say like Ireland and the world has never been as ready to really have conversations about climate change and about actually taking this seriously. And, you know, they're using violent civil disobedience as well. They're breaking the, what they're, they're not doing what they're meant to do. You know, they're not going to school. It's, and it's, it's ruffling feathers, but it's really getting noticed. This was inspired by Greta Thunberg's um, climate strike back in May, maybe last October. So Greta, there's fantastic uh, talk of her speaking at a European delegation and also at Davos World Economic Forum. And when she spoke last month at a plenary session of the European Economic and Social Committee in Brussels, uh, John Claude Juncker, the uh, president <coughs> of the EU Commission, <coughs> uh, said that a quarter of the EU budget would now be spent on tackling climate change, up from what I from what I gather was one percent. This is Clock Jordan, our own strikes. This was yesterday where we did we tidy paired up with Tidy Towns and we did a lot of planting. Uh, and this was before where we had uh, Friends of the Earth here as well. Speaking about Extinction Rebellion, which is this talk, their new grassroots organisa uh, organization campaigning for radical changes in government policy about climate change. Uh, this movement start, was launched publicly back in October in the UK. The symbol is an hourglass showing that, you know, the time is now, it's now or never, and time is running out. Dedicated to non-violent civil disobedience as one method of raising public uh, awareness and putting pressure on politicians. And uh, in the backing of over 100 academics, including Dr. Rowan Williams, Archbishop of Canterbury, but also um, Naom Chomsky, Naomi Klein, and many others. So since that time, Extinction Rebellion, it's in five months, it's active in over 32 uh, countries, a social media a, a representation of over a million. So there's three demands, Ireland's three de uh, Extinction Rebellion Ireland's, that the government declares a state of climate emergency and launches a media campaign to educate the public about the seriousness of the environmental crisis and the steps necessary to combat it. So pretty similar to the students, uh, to the school strike, uh, demands. So <coughs> uh, they need the media to convey this. I know in the UK there was pr protests outside the BBC, see no climate change, hear no climate change, speak no climate change. This me message needs to be brought to people because if people don't know, how are we going, um, how are we going to make the changes that we need to make? So that the government 
immediately uh, implements the recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly as a first step towards uh, tackling climate change uh, and implementation of policies that will reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2030. So we don't want uh, the government to just have emergency powers, we want some method for more participatory democracy and the Citizens' Assembly, Assembly have made a start towards this, but this would be a first step, we need to go further than this. The last one being that all policy changes are kept with the idea of a just transition where the most vulnerable aren't expected to sacrifice the most and that the transition be made within the uh, context of a global context. So this is like one of the real learnings from the Elevest protest where we can see that like essentially as a carbon tax, you know, which could in, in theory be a benefit uh, uh, for climate action, but yet we can see that People, it just won't work if those who are more vulnerable feel they're being expected to pay unfairly given so much of the damage is being caused by the wealthy and the elite. The elite. So we need a just transition uh, because that's more likely to work and because that's more the world we want to create. I've met so many actions. This is some of Extinction Rebellion's actions. Uh, and 17th of November, hundreds of activists blocked the five major bridges in London. That's a huge action. They're like stopping the city. We had solidarity events in Dublin uh, on the 17th and, and around the world. This is only from a couple of weeks, uh, a few weeks ago. So hundreds of protesters outside Downing Street. So through litres of blood, I think 200 litres of blood in front of Downing Street, symbolising the blood of our children. Um, Real blood? No, it's paint. <laughs> it's paint. But nonetheless, like I know they were saying, like, and they're, like they're very public about how they go about their actions. So they're like, people knew this was coming, but they're like, oh, they, they would think that the police are more likely to want to actually have them contained in one space rather than stop them here and there and everywhere. And if they did, then they just pour the paint there. So either way, it's a win-win in that That's regard. That's the best job cleaning it up. Yeah, yeah. No, they've done a lot of actions as well, like for instance, spray painting, like I saw one <coughs> outside Barclays Bank where they're like toxic bankers, but they'd spray it with chalk paint, you know, create an action, uh, generate some media, and then clean it off. But they're becoming more disruptive as well. Like, so for instance, I'll speak more about inter like they're gearing up towards International Week of Rebellion, which is the 15th of April, and they really intend closing down the city. Do you know, like even today, uh, I haven't heard updates on it, but I know the plan has been to block the motorway into Dover to really highlight that how much of our food, uh, the food in the UK is through imports, how vulnerable that leaves them to, <coughs> um, yeah, to food security issues. And also show them when the people rise up, uh, you know, the people, like, the people can shut down the city. So this is, again, this was just one very symbolic uh, act. Um, but, you know, got front page in the paper here as well. Um, yeah, and their plan is to block four major sites uh, in, uh, in the UK until enough people are either arrested, which generates a huge amount of media, or until the authorities enter into negotiations. This is Extinction Rebellion Ireland. This was on March the 3rd, which turned out to be a very, very wet day. We had, uh, this was a funeral for humanity's future. So we had a talk about the Spire Eve, and, and my daughter who's 11, she spoke at this, which was great. Um, we had, yeah, we had music, we had different speakers, and then we carried a coffin from O'Connell Street up to Grafton Street. Uh, and this was page three of the Irish Times. So again, this is one way of really bringing this message more mainstream. So there was another action we did on Grafton Street in relation to Shannon LNG. Um, <coughs> so we are planning other events uh, around uh, the country. We're planning events for International Week of Rebellion. This is uh, just, a, uh, I'm not going to speak much of this, this is Project Drawdown. So this is looking at, there are many, many proposed solutions to climate change. And that there are many answers out there. Uh, some of, I mean, the IPCC re relies a lot on carbon capture and store, you know, so technologies which aren't fully de um, developed yet or haven't proven themselves. So we really need a plan based on what's what we do have and what's possible. But there are possibilities there. Um, and yet, Extinction Rebellion isn't, 
detailing the specifics of how we need to make these changes. These discussions take time. Uh, what we're Extinction Rebellion do, is doing primarily is call, calling for f that fire, calling for the sense of urgency, and thereafter we can direct attention towards the solutions. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of changes we need to make individually in our own lives, and yet we also need policy changes. I heard someone speaking recently, he was saying, uh, again, David Wallace Wells, if I have his name right, was saying that uh, the guy interviewing was saying that he still flies and has, you know drives a car and does a lot of stuff that he knows, you know, isn't in keeping with uh, the changes we need to make. Um, and yet, saying you know, if he does not fly, that's not going to stop climate change. And the, uh, I think David Wallace Wells said that he says, what was it? He said, like for instance, with taxes, we don't make it a voluntary contribution. This is what policies are for, to direct us as a people at large. So, so I want to introduce the idea of the Overton window as one of the last ideas to really bring in. This is the idea of what the public are willing to accept. Okay, so what's perceived as normal. And if we think about Irish society over the last 50 years, think about gay marriage, think about abortion, um, divorce. 50 years ago, these would have been unthinkable and criminal. Now they're just, you know, now they're things we celebrate, some of the, you know, we celebrate in ways. So the Overton window has shifted. So in terms of climate change, we want uh, the public's perception of this to shift from something that's uh, something in the future, something which our grandkids might have to face, to being something that's of immediate uh, importance to us in our lives. So that we're, ex we're facing an extinction crisis. And this is something which we can all help shift. So by our conversations, that we, uh, by engaging with events, by supporting these types of events, by sharing stuff on Facebook, by any, any of these means, we're keeping this subject alive. So there's, for Extinction Rebellion, there's many different roles, many different ways of getting involved. <coughs> Uh, starting place will be, a, we've got a lot of uh, feedback, I've got feedback forms uh, which people can kind of fill in, which we could, from that you can meet, you'll be on a mailing list, you will be invited into Slack, um, which is, also we have International Week of Rebellion, we have an event planned on Good Friday, we're most likely going to blockade uh, O'Connell Bridge, uh, we're having some of these things, these plans are still being developed. So there's a meeting tomorrow here, Clock Jordan. So if people are available, uh, support it would be great because these plans are still being developed. Plans for International Week of Rebellion, but also the wider actions that we continue to do in Ireland. Um, there's a lot of Facebook pages relating to this. The international school strike. There's another school, international school strike planned later in May. Uh, we have an Active Hope workshop planned in Club Jordan on the 14th of April, which I think, you know, we need to stay aware of the information that's there and the updating information about the climate crisis, the ecological crisis, but we also need to continue to support ourselves emotionally as well, to be able to connect with this material and stay well in ourselves, stay resilient, make the changes in our lives and uh, to avoid burnout and overwhelm. What's the XR declaration? Oh, this particular one here? This is <coughs> a Facebook group that has started up. There's many of them. As I say, Deep Adaptation uh, Facebook, which is a very interesting one relating to Jen Bendel, his Deep Adaptation paper. So people who are looking at these changes, he would say the inevitable near-term societal collapse. So these are, this is people coming together to speak about what does that mean, but not just in a prepper terms of how do I store up food, but actually... Um, what does that mean for how I relate to people, like, um, you know, to my own process of grief around that? So the same with this, this is the aching heart movement, grief in the wake of the XOR dec a declaration. Because for a lot of people, this is, for all of this, this should be upsetting at some level. If we're not feeling some level of grief or fear, then we're probably not taking it as serious as it is. And usually with grief, we find support with others. So these are some online uh, ways where people are supporting themselves to process this. So for Extinction Rebellion, we need a lot of things. We need people giving these and other talks. We need people setting up local groups, fundraisers, spokespeople for this campaign, organizers. A lot of these 
events take like any of the events we've done in Dublin, they take quite a lot of organize simple things with people involved, take quite a bit of organization. So we need people involved, we need people coming to actions, legal observers at actions. So there's so many different roles, and one of them with this nonviolent civil disobedience is some people to get arrested. So this won't be for everyone, but this is one way which a small number of people can have a large impact. It can be a very powerful way um, of getting the message across. So we know from talking to I think, a major publication, I have in mind it was The Guardian, said that if 50 people arrested over a climate action would lead to a front page publication. And this is what we need, the message needs to be conveyed. So we have had training sessions on this, on non-violent civil disobedience, on the different roles in that, on legal observers. Even at tomorrow's uh, meeting and workshop, there will be some uh, legal training and legal advice on impl uh, implications of being arrested, on implications of being involved like in any of these different roles. So this won't be for everyone, but again, if if someone is willing, this can be one powerful way to use our freedom to really um, bring forward this message. Um, don't want to, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real decision for everybody to make uh, individually. And I would say, considering the implications, and you, well, on one level, considering where we're at, what have we got to lose? You know, we need, uh, but at the same time, if you are applying for citizenship to Ireland or in any, in any other vulnerable position, don't get yourself arrested. Um, again, we need lots of different roles. So coming towards the end, I want to speak about one of the most important things, so motivation. Knowing from the, knowing from the outset that the obstacles we're facing are huge, we really, you know, we may not succeed. Um, and yet, um, from an ethics and a moral perspective, it's always worth doing something if it's morally right. So quoting Kate Marvel again, courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. She says in many ways what we're talking about are uh, traditional virtues here, oriented towards service to com uh, community and a desire to be a worthy ancestor. Fully understanding that we will die someday and this could be soon and wishing to live a meaningful life. Facing the risk of earth, uh, life on earth dying and be willing to step into service to something bigger than ourselves. So for some, this is a basic orientation of our spiritual expression, the part of us that really understands what's sacred and that we're part of something larger than our own lives. So to end, I want to just um, allow us just to reflect on three questions. So just taking these one at a time and just seeing what response comes within us. So what does it, in light of what I've heard, what does it mean for me to be a good human? What does it mean to die without regrets? And will we be able to look our grandchildren in the eye and say we did what we could? Okay, so thank you for your attention.